So here we are, technically the last lecture of the semester, Friday, April 17th. Now, as I start, I have one other lecture on the syllabus, and it's on nitrogen metabolism, uptake and metabolism. And I would like to record that lecture. Um, I won't put that material on the test, but I'd like to record it just because other people have been watching these on the internet, and uh, that's, nitrogen is an important component of uh, plant metabolism. But today, freezing stress. Now, this is a big deal because in the spring, we're trying to get plants in the ground and it's still pretty cold. We have cold nights. Um, we have chilling injury. Um, we don't have high temperature injury yet, but temperature stress is a huge thing. Let's start, and I'm looking at all my notes, let's start just with high temperature stress. Now, what happens with high temperature is membranes start to fall apart and they get leaky. And in that leaky doesn't death, but it's sure hard on the plant. But I think when I read all the high temperature literature, as you can imagine, when the temperature gets hot, the VPD, I'll put this in another, um, we might almost call this vapor pressure deficit stress because much of high temperature stress is really associated with water stress. If you can keep the water flowing through the plant, you can keep the leaves cool. And there's some famous cases of cotton. It's a crop that is grown in really hot climates and takes a lot of water. People have measured the leaves of cotton getting more than 10 degrees Celsius cooler than the air temperature by evaporative cooling. So here's, it. cotton is a C3 plant and it's grown in high temperatures, but if you keep it watered, you don't have high temperature stress. So the high, water and high temperature interact with each other. Let me show you a graph of high temperature stress. And there we go. I guess we could zoom in just a bit. Um, the details aren't, of this aren't that critical, and I could draw them on the board. I gonna need, I need to get down here where you can see the x-axis. So this starts at 35 Celsius, and let's see, 35 is uh, 95 Fahrenheit, and that's where this graph starts. And then it goes to 40 is 104 Fahrenheit, and on up, super hot temperatures. The effect on photosynthesis and respiration, let's take photosynthesis first, we're, we're going, we're going, this is no water stress now, just temperature. We start to get up into the hundreds, and I, I'm not familiar with these species, but one is far more tolerant of high temperature than the other. And this photosynthesis just starts to drop off. The enzymes denature, can't keep up, and at even a hotter temperature, this is now 50, this high temperature one drops off quickly. So, Photosynthesis starts to drop off. Respiration, now we're into the Krebs cycle, is a little bit more hardy. They both make it up here to 50, and then boom, they just drop off fast, and the, the enzymes in respiration decrease. So these curves are typical. There's not really a long, slow decline. It's, it's more of a abrupt change once it gets to a critical temperature in it drops, provided this is not coupled with uh, water stress. Now, this last one is important. Look at these lines. They go the opposite direction. This graph is ion leakage. And if we take a cell, we're going to get back to 
cells for all of this stuff. Here's a cell, and we'll do cell wall, something like this. And then inside the cell wall is a membrane. And this is a me the name of this membrane is one you have to memorize for lower level classes. You guys remember what this is? It's the main membrane. PM, plasma membrane. Now, all the, all the membranes have different names, but this is the key one inside the cell. At high temperatures, this membrane can't stay functional. And remember that we, we always draw this membrane. We can say it's a lipid membrane. So we have heads of lipids down here. This, this is a diagram of how that membrane looks close up. At high temperatures, these just get leaky. And that doesn't kill the plant, it's leaky. And when it's leaky, ions, let's, let's put potassium here, leaks out. All the ions do this, but, but potassium's essential element, and it's really soluble. High temperature starts to leak out. So, look at how we can measure the amount of stress. It's really simple. That's over here. If we take a leaf from a plant that's been stressed, and put it in water. Now we put a little bit of wetting agent in here to make sure this thing is just a drop. Remember wetting agents are the surfactant, like so. And the ions, if, they're, if this leaf is healthy, ions don't leak out. If it's been stressed, ions leak out. And if ions leak out, what happens to electrical conductivity? So we just set this up. Here's an electrical conductivity meter. Here's a leaf. And we can measure the leakiness of the membranes just with this very simple test. This is why I think everybody ought to own one of these electrical conductivity meters. You can check leaves. We've done this a lot in this lab. And sometimes we let them sit for an hour. Sometimes we let them sit for six hours. And it's, it helps to have a comparison leaf that's not been stressed. Um, but very healthy membranes don't leak ions. So the number stays really low. And the more leaky it is, the more the plant has been stressed. So uh, this high temperature stress, we might get death in here at some point of the plant when everything collapses. But it's more often just very stressful for the plant. But it can recover. And usually it's recovering at night. And that depends on how many days of high temperature there is. Now here in Logan, Utah, we're not that worried about high temperature stress because look, everyone around here is complaining when we start to get in the beginning of this graph. It's hot, you know, and if we ever, we had never even got to 40 in Logan, Utah. And that's just the start. So this is more for people living in Arizona where they really, really hot. Make sure I don't have uh, other things I want to say about uh, high temperature stress. Um, uh, let me follow up a bit on water stress and high temperature stress. Water stress, and this is all stress physiology, right? So water stress limits, we'll, we'll just say yield, limits growth. Temperature stress limits 
distribution. And here when we say temperature stress, this is mostly low temperature stress. Water stress is happening all the time. Little amounts of water stress, sometimes big. It rarely kills the plant, it just reduces yield. Temperature stress, once a plant freezes, it's dead. And, and you just there's a bunch of plants here in northern Utah we just can't grow because it gets too cold in the winter. So um, temperature stress is much more studied in horticulture. And water stress is much more studied in agronomy. Now, we got to have a tea there. What's the difference between horticulture and agronomy? Types of crops you grow? It's, it's types of crops. Here's, there's, there's more than one definition, but here's the one that is, I like the best. If the crop is stored dry, it's an agronomic crop. The seeds of wheat, rice, corn, soybeans, they're all stored dry. Those are agronomic crops. If the crop is stored fresh, it's a horticulture crop. Fresh vegetables, fresh leafy greens. This is a pretty good definition. Um, this is the the, the, I'm going to say the crop um, is versus dry versus fresh. Um, it gets a little messy because how about potatoes? Well, potatoes are stored fresh, but in many universities, potatoes are studied in agronomy departments because they're low value. Now, typically, these are lower value, and these are high value. So that's a, it's an interesting distinction. Many schools have separate departments of horticulture and agronomy because they're just, the crops are managed differently. Um, these are so high value, we can afford to have lot, all kinds of irrigation and lots of specialty fertilizers. And these, you, you want to minimize fertilizer because it's an expensive part of the whole production system. Same thing with water. All right. That's as much as I want to say about high temperature. Most of this discussion is low temperature, most of this lecture. Chilling injury. You guys heard of chilling injury? Very few people have heard of it. Freezing is easy. When, if you freeze, you're dead. Chilling is quite different. Freezing, of course, water changes state at zero degrees C. Chilling begins to occur at 10 degrees C. 10 degrees C, that's 50 Fahrenheit. So even if you put tomatoes out right now, even if they didn't freeze, Every single night they would get chilling injury. And even if you covered them and kept them from freezing, every night they're getting hammered from chilling injury. Long about June, the nights start to stay above 10, and then the plants take off. And, and, and it's, a lot of that is chilling injury. Here's what happens, and this is a perfect segue from my diagram like this. Membranes, these lipid membranes, get leaky when they get cold. This membrane has to be fluid. It has to be in a liquid state to function. Now, if I would have thought ahead, I would have brought a bunch of cooking oil and put it out here, and we would have put some in the refrigerator. But let's, so I didn't do that, so we got to imagine it. Here's the, here's the thought experiment. Really easy to do. Here's the Erlenmeyer flask. 
You can also do this with the glass. And then you put some water in here. And, and really just regular tap water is fine. Now you go to your collection of cooking oils and what do we have? Coconut oil, sunflower, um, what else? Corn oil, canola, canola great. You, you, the huge list. Look, all these plants, we extracted their oils and sold it for cooking. Take these, now you gotta have one beaker for each. Put them in here. And you just need a drop of oil. How are we gonna show our drop of oil? Brown. This oil will spread out on this surface right here. Over this. All of a sudden, we have a model of a cell. This cell right here, Here's our model. This is the cytoplasm. All the ions, all the biochemistry, we could start putting salts in here and do all kinds of fancy stuff. And guess what? PM, that's right there. Plasma membrane. Now we take this beaker, and it's all good. And they say, put it on a shelf. How much evaporation is there from that? Almost none because it's covered with lipid. Even if it's just a thin film of lipid, it's preventing evaporation. It's keeping things intact. So this thin layer of oil is fragile, but it's also, look what it's doing when we, when we put it over this. So I love this analogy because it's like single beaker um, cytology and cell physiology just with this. By the way, if you want to get even more accurate, you go get some window screen. And now we'll show that up here. And you put that over the top. What's the window screen represent? Cell wall. Yep, cell wall. Now, do you think insects can get in here? Mm -mm. Pretty tough. They got to auger through the cell wall. Do you think water can get through? You bet it can. It goes right through the window screen. It doesn't, if solutions go right through. So the plasma membrane is what's holding everything together. And then that's in turn protected by the window screen cell wall. Bob. So that's a great example to think through plants. And as this, the tur and then we could do more. We could get turgor going on in here, and the turgor would be pushing up on the cell wall. And there's an enormous, enormous amount of stuff you can do with this. But for now, we're going to do chilling injury. We're going to take, and we could go on with different things, with different kinds of oils. They're all plant-based oils. Olive oil, we get in here. We got to put olive oil on here. Olive oil manufacturers would be upset if we didn't put them on the list. Um, now we take all of these and we put them in the freezer and it freezes and the beaker breaks and it's dead. That's freezing injury. But we put them in the refrigerator. And what's the temperature of a fridge? A typical fridge is about four degrees C. I could put a range two to six, but we try to keep them above freezing so nothing freezes but cold. Chilling injury starts at 10. Every one of these gets chilling injury. Just put them in there overnight, you take them out. Especially the coconut oil is going to be solid. And it, when it goes solid, it gets cracks. And when it gets cracks, there are leaks. So we got a big problem with chilling injury. Some of these can take cold temperatures better than others. And if they take cold temperatures, they don't get chilling injury if they can stay in the liquid state. But all of these, when it gets cold enough, they start to go solid. And many studies have indicated 
for typical plants, 10 degrees C, 50 Fahrenheit. It's a nice data point to memorize for making conversions. Uh, and this is an example of what happens. Guess how we test for this? If we've seen a plant having chilling injury, the next day, we go get a plant, we get a beaker of deionized water, and we do this test. And if it leaks and the electrical connectivity goes up, that plant's had chilling injury. This is an easy test to do. We put, I used to do a lab where we had two plants, one not chilled, one chilled overnight, and we wheel them out, and the students had to do this test and say, which plant got chilling injury? Because you can't tell by looking, but you can definitely tell from ion leakage of the of the plants. So ion integrity is a, is a uh, big deal. This is a, a diagram out of a plant physiology textbook showing cool and rigid and warm and this looks, looks bad but this means it's a fluid membrane. And the are doing this. Um, so that's chilling injury. And plants recover from it. It never kills the plant. It just injures it. And imagine our tomatoes now out in the spring. Oof, they get hit that night. The whole day they recover. They get hit again the next night. They're not really growing. They just sit there. <laughs> and how come my plants aren't, aren't growing? Yeah, well, they're getting chilling injury. Uh, let me show you a chart that I have made that helps drive this home. Many species of crops do not get chilling injury. They just don't have it. They, the structure of the lipids in their membranes are such, they stay liquid down to cool temperatures down to zero, other crops are real sensitive. This, which I will send this whole thing by, uh, as a handout, is a classification of vegetable crops into optimum temperature for growth. First of all, we get cool season vegetables and warm season vegetables. The cool seasons are almost always crops where we eat the vegetative part of the plant. The leaves of lettuce, the roots of carrots and onions, um, cabbage, cauliflower, and broccoli, the broccoli. These are all cool temperature optimum plants. Over here, if we eat the reproductive parts, tomatoes, melons, seed crops, peppers, these are reproductive plants, all right? And they, the, the structure that we eat um, dictates which class they're in, then all of these are tolerant of frost. They can take temperature slightly below freezing, and they are tolerant of chilling. They just don't get chilling injury. And right now, this time of year, we want to be planting all of these because they don't have this problem. Over here, these are sensitive to frost, and they're also sensitive to chilling, all of them. So we just need warmer temperatures to grow these. Now, there are two exceptions to this rule. Peas and potatoes. Peas are cool, and that's, they flower. We eat the peas. That's reproductive, but peas are in the cool temperature category. And over here, potatoes, that's not a reproductive structure. That's a tuber. And they're frost sensitive, but guess what? Potatoes are also unique. Potatoes don't get chilling injury, none. So we can grow them, but they sure get freezing injury. They're sensitive, but they're a unique crop where they, most, most times if it's sensitive to, really sensitive to frost, it's also sensitive to chilling. This not only affects the growing plants, it affects the fruits of the plant's chilling injury. So it, all of these things, you bring them home, do you put them in the fridge or do you leave them on the counter? Hmm. It 
turns out it's better to leave them on the counter if you can keep them hydrated. If they dry out, they're in bad shape. And here's a test. If you take a cucumber, you got to have two cucumbers for this test. And you put one in the fridge, one on the shelf. And you watch them for a week, and they're about the same. But now take the one out of the fridge and put it on the counter for a day or two. It'll get moldy. It'll, it's, it's, it's had severe chilling injury, and it, it, you need to take it out and eat it right away. But if, and it shows on cucumbers even after one day in the fridge. Chills them, they can't recover. Here's the big crop That's, that we all eat, bananas. Now, I wish I should have brought an actual banana in here. Bananas get severe chilling injury. And we typically don't store bananas in the fridge because of the chilling injury. There was an ad many years ago by Chiquita Banana, the big um, company. And, and it was on the radio, it was on TV, it was everywhere. Before. Twitter and Facebook, but it said something like, I still remember this song, but uh, I'm Shakita Banana and I'm here to say um, bananas are a it rhyme, I can't remember the whole verse, but bananas are a product of the tropical equator, so you should never keep bananas in your refrigerator. <laughs> and so I'm traveling around in somewhere, Panama or something, and I find on the wall of this store this. I don't know if you can see this, but it's a thermometer, and it says banana storage temperature. And it has a zone where it's optimum, and it's like 15 Celsius. Um, and it too cold and too hot. And it, it was a whole thermometer for how to keep bananas. Um, so once you think about this for bananas, we usually don't put them in the fridge. Or if you do, take them out and they turn black pretty fast because they got chilling injury. So that helps, the bananas help drive home the point of this. And once you put some fruits and things in the, in the uh, fridge, that's fine, but you gotta eat them. You can't take them back out and leave them on the counter. How about apples? We keep apples in the fridge all the time. Ah, apples don't get chilling injury. They, they're, they're best in the fridge. It's just tropical fruits that, that uh, get bad chilling injury. All right. Let me see if I have anything else on chilling, I want to say. Now, freezing. Can plants take, I put zero C. This is the exact temperature that water changes state. But what if we put this beaker of water in a, fr a fridge? Fridges are usually more like minus 10 Celsius, or freezer rather, fridge freezer. Freezers are more like minus 10. See, sometimes colder than that. You put your ice cubes in, they freeze. What if we put this beaker at minus one degree C? Carefully controlled fridge. Would it freeze? This is, we'll make this dramatic because this is an expensive glass beaker and we're trying to see if it freezes, we got a problem with plant metabolism. Would it freeze at minus 1C? This is roughly 30 Fahrenheit. It wouldn't. Why not? Doesn't water change state at zero? There's ions in here. And salt or ions bind some of the water 
and keep it from freezing. Does the ocean freeze when it gets cold? No, it does not. I mean, if it gets really cold, the ocean freezes, but it does not. There's ions in here. And these ions keep the plant from freezing for a little bit. The more ions, the more protected it is. And one way to get more ions is to water stress the plant. And it concentrates solutes. So if that's what we call hardening off, if you water stress your transplants, they get more tolerant of freezing because they get more ions. So you'll be pleased to know there's an equation between ion concentration and freezing tolerance. And let's put this up here. Freezing point depression. Meaning the number, it's in degree C. It's the number of degree C the freezing point goes down. Equals 1.86 times molal al concentration cn of ions remember molar and molal are similar but molal is grams per kilogram there are no natural logs no square roots this is a pretty simple equation and in fact we do this and two times ions is pretty much the freezing point depression, rounding it up. Now, how, how many ions are in here? Typical plant. This is typically one to two moles of ions. I'm, I'm going to put, well, I'll put per kilogram and I'll put liter here, parentheses, almost the same thing. One to two. Great. So now we can run the entire equation. Two times one, let me see. Two times one is two degrees C freezing point depression. And if you really got a lot of ions in there, we get four degrees C. So that's the first line of defense. These, there's some ions in there, the plants don't freeze right away. And this is really all plants. It, it just doesn't immediately freeze, but it depends. These are small numbers. If you're doing Fahrenheit, you can go from 32 to 31 to maybe 30 to 29. And boy, this time of year, we're, if you're a commercial grower outside, you're worried about the exact temperature because it's going to kill your crop. All right. Let's take a crop. Kale. Bring in kale. I don't know if you've ever grown kale. It's an important crop, man. It's terrific. Underutilized. Really good for you, loaded with chlorophyll. And many tell you, tough as nails. I've had kale in my yard. If the deer don't eat it in the winter, it starts growing again in the spring. That crop is tough. Now, there's other crops pretty tough too, but for now, kale's the champion. How far below freezing do you think kale can get? It's way below. Kale can go down to probably 10. Oh, it could easily go minus 10 Celsius below freezing and still stay alive. Do you think it's loaded with salts? Turns out it's not. Two is about as good as we can get for salts. Maybe a really, really, really salt, maybe I should put, this is really technically 1.86. Let's say times three, this would be super loaded with salts. So we're still only five degrees C for protection from salts. How's kale do it if it doesn't have, if it didn't have that much salt? Do you remember in beginning chemistry, at least for me, I remember this, one of the first things in Chemistry 101, the lab, is in a boil water. So you take one of our beakers, 
and you put it on a hot plate. And draw another picture of a beaker here. It's got water in it. And now this thing is on a hot plate. And you, like you wear goggles and a lab coat, and for God's sake, all you're doing is boiling water. But you had to put in here a little boiling chip. Now, not everybody does this stuff, but what did that boiling chip do? And why was that so important? If you didn't put that in, you'd fail the class. This is called, it's called a boiling chip because it catalyzes the boiling reaction. And when does water boil? At sea level? 100 degrees Celsius. Yep. 100 C, 212 F. If you don't put that boiling chip in and you have deionized water and you bring the temperature up, it goes to 101. It can be 110. It can even be 115. It didn't, not boiling. And then you put the chip in and it explodes. And it, boom! <laughs> and if, even if you don't put the chip in, you bump the bench and boom! And the water blows up and you burn your face and your parents sue the university and you got problems. So put the boiling, and you fail the class too. You gotta put the boiling chip in and when that's in there, it boils at 100. It catalyzes this reaction so it boils at the temperature it's supposed to. And this process has a name and it is called superheating. So chaos is a super cool. Yeah. And the same thing happens in the other direction. If you take, this is cool enough if you want to demonstrate it in your house, try to put boiling water on your ceiling. <laughs> it, helps, it happens with tap water too, but it really happens with deionized water. So now let's take the other direction and we're going to put this beaker in the freezer and measure the temperature. Now you got to have a thermocouple that goes in there, but the exact thing happens on the other end and it's called supercooling. And for me, the best way I demonstrate this, it's a little clever trick for parties. You take your carbonated beverages, your beers and your sodas and everything, and you put them outside and you get them cold and then you bring them in and you pop the top and you quickly pour it in a glass and it turns to slush in the glass. And it's, it's, if you get good at it, it's really impressive. That's super cooling. It was liquid in the glass and as soon as you catalyze the reaction, it, it froze and it froze fast. That's why you gotta be quick and get the slush out of the glass. But this all plants super cool all plants and they can get colder and colder and colder and they don't need ions they just sit there and super cool and super cooling let's put this on here number one solutes solutes to about minus I'm going to put minus 4 degrees C. This is all plants. Super cooling. There's a limit for how cold we can go in super cooling, and it's a physical limit. It's called the ice nucleation point, and it it's, goes to minus 40 C. If you do it right, you can get right to minus 40 C. So this is obviously real powerful, and it takes over after this, but plants vary a lot in how much they can super cool. As long as they don't turn to ice, they're not dead. They can recover. But the minute ice forms in here, just like our beaker cracks the beaker, the plant's dead. So there is a bacteria that it's just, I know it especially on strawberries that
causes ice nucleation quickly, it, it, it keeps the plant from supercooling and it, and it causes ice to form in the, in the strawberries you're dead. So people genetically modified the bacteria so without this gene and you can spray it. If you're going to be a frost, you go out and spray it and then it allows the plants to supercool. And it's real effective, but it's genetically modified and I'm not even sure if it's commercially, do you know if this is commercially used? It's not anymore. Yeah. Um, it, it was. They started testing it and started getting really good results and then environmental people shut them down because it was GMO. It's GMO, yeah. yeah. Oh, there's pictures of people. It's just a bacteria in solution. And they were out there in hazmat suits and big fences and testing it and stuff. But, but it's a big, it's a story about if, if we can, could we genetically modify plants to supercool better? You know, maybe. But that's number two, and this happens in all plants. Let me see if I had anything else I want to say about supercooling. No. Um, this, but there's a third mechanism. Plants grow in places where it gets colder than minus 40 C. Alaska, trees, above the Arctic Circle. Plants are not all killed even at minus 40 C, and that's way below the solute set point, so there's got to be a third mechanism. And you're going to love this because it comes right out of plant water potential. <laughs> But it's, um, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to call this solute concentration. Um, now, that's, this is solute concentration. But if we take right here a bunch of cells, in a leaf, and the solutes are in here, and it gets colder and colder, and we go past minus 4C, and we start to super cool a little, but this right inside the cell is called the symplast, And what's this called in between the cells? Apoplast. Apoplast, yeah. How many ions are in the apoplast? Hardly any. It's just water. So when the temperature gets cold, now we're going to show this with uh, purple. That's a pretty cold temperature. Boom. This water freezes in between the cells. Did that kill the plant? It feels like it's frozen. I've looked at my leaves in there. They, yeah, this is a goner, it's frozen. Uh-uh. It doesn't kill the plant because the water is still liquid here and the membranes are still intact. Only this non-living water freezes. What do you think happens to the water potential when it freezes? When this freezes, the water potential gets lower, more negative. And if this gets more negative, what do you think happens to the water in here? It moves out. The water inside the cell moves out into the apoplast, and the cell gets more concentrated. The ions don't move out, just the water, because it's a passive gradient. And now there's more water out there. It super cools for a little while, and boom, that freezes. So now the cell is way past permanent wilting point. It's all shriveled in here, with, but it's not dead. It's, it, it's the membrane's intact, gets more concentrated, and this happens again, more moves out, and it just keeps going. And this allows plants to 
go to extremely cold temperatures. I mean, I don't know what the limit is. Maybe she should look this up. How cold have plants gotten? I don't know. I'm going to put minus, what's the coldest place on the planet? I don't know, minus 80 C or something. Some super cold temperature because this keeps moving out of the, of the uh, simplex. Now, eventually, the plant can't keep dehydrating like this, and it dies. And if we draw a graph of this is delta temperature, and this is zero, and this is time, and this is usually in hours. So start at zero. We, uh, we, take, we do this all the time with, with pieces of tissue from all kinds of plants because we want to know how cold tolerant they are. So we insert a little thermocouple and we start to cool the plant. And we watch this line and we're cooling the plant and, all, and the apoplast super cooled and all of a sudden this jumps up because it, boom. The water in the apoplast froze, and guess what? When water freezes, it gives up heat. So we measure that. Okay, we cool it some more. More happens. More happens. This is getting colder. Who knows? This might be minus, we'll call this minus 20. Some number here still going. Then what we see is this keeps going, going, and then there's a blip down here. And this is death. The, finally, the, the, it's some pretty cold temperature, minus 40 or minus 80. Depends on the crop. But this, is, this the whole thing is called a freezing isotherm. And we've, some labs run this. That's their whole specialty. Um, but in the, of course, then this keeps going. Um, but this is how we can tell if a plant can tolerate the winter, where we are by um, how well, how far below freezing it can get. And this is the mechanism, water moving out and freezing. Now, it helps if when the sun comes up the next morning, the plant can rehydrate, because all of a sudden, you got some really saline cytoplasm and the apoplast water starts to melt and these cells rehydrate. So slow, slow rewarming really helps. You wonder if, if uh, this principle could be used with people that freeze people and bring them back. I don't know. I'm sure there's people working on it. Uh, but this is, this is solute concentration and it goes way, way uh, down. Um, if there's some new horticultural species, some shrub or something we think we might want to grow, we would, somebody would run this test on it, and it's a reproducible test, and they'll say, okay, this is good to some temperature, and then, then it dies. But it's basically dehydrating. This is also why if we take transplants and let them practice cold temperatures, they get better at it. This plants can dehydrate and freeze and rehydrate better if they practice. And our world champion kale over there, it really gets good at this by fall. A lot of practice. But you can take kale in the spring and put it out and it's never seen cold temperatures. You can kill it pretty fast because it's not had a chance to practice. And much of that is this water moving in and out of the, of the plant. That's called hardening off of these. And really, if, you, if a plant can pl practice being water stressed, it also gets better at, at tolerating cold temperatures, too. Let's see. There's another way plants get generally better at this. I mean, I can even call this a fourth category here. Um, I'm going to erase that. Bound water.
there's free water in cells and there's bound water in cells. Same thing with soils. It's water's bound to the soil particles. It's free. The free water's taken up. Same thing in plants. Let me give an analogy of a t-shirt. If you took a typical t-shirt and put it in the freezer, would it freeze? Well, no, because it's still, you take it out, it's cold, but it's not stiff. There's not enough water in it. Is there water in that t-shirt and the cotton? You bet there is. You put it in the oven and bake it, and it's going to weigh a little less. So there was some water in there, but it was bound. And if that water is tightly bound, it can't freeze. So now take a plant inside of our cell over here, and we have proteins. Here's a protein. And guess what? Um, H2O, H2O, it's surrounded with water, bound water. This bound water will not freeze. It's bound to the proteins. It's just like it would be with salts in here. Salts are in solution. So plants can, some plants have more bound water. And when this water is bound, the plant can take cold temperatures and freezing temperatures a lot better. So that's one of the things that happens with plants getting bound, more water bound. So the plant stays hydrated with water um, that doesn't, doesn't freeze. It has to be free liquid water out here to, to uh, turn to ice. And this varies with plants, how much bound water they get. The better, and again, guess what? It related to water stress, too. If you get more water stress, the plants will bind more water to protect the proteins from water stress. So, I'm going to show you a couple of some, some data on freezing. It's a, it's a very, when, when this happens, your plants are dead. It's lethal. So we would like to know what kind of plants we can grow in a given area. So we take climate data. Let me show you the climate data first. Um, this is, this is, this is from uh, the USU campus, which you can see this data in real time on, uh, at weather.usu.edu. Let me write this up here. Uh, no more room. Weather. .usu.edu. This is, I take graphs off of this web to uh, put on exams. And, um, but this is all of our climate data for campus. Now here's climate data. Weather is the, the most recent stuff, the last few days. And climate's long-term stuff. Here is min, max, and average temperature for campus over the last, this, this one goes back to 200 and 2015. I haven't updated this, but it just keeps updating, shows the last four years. Here's these coldest points down here, you know, and, there's, and, and this year we got to minus 20. Oof. So every plant that could not take minus 20 is permanently dead. And, and this is includes some kinds of peaches and some long-term plants that are just, just one night at that temperature, that's it. They're, they're done. They're dead. These minus temperatures determine what we call the climate zone. And let me show you how that is changing. Before we had the campus, I was doing this at home. And now look at this data. I can zoom out just a little for the 1990s. Here's a couple years, 1989. But look at this, 1990, it got to minus 31 in Cache Valley. 
hasn't been that cold since, but that killed a whole bunch of trees all over the valley. Really nice things, it just couldn't handle it. Boom, goners. Um, and it didn't take long to uh, get that cold. So we record this and we make, the USDA makes this plant hardiness map the, all over the, and, and we put zone numbers on this. And here's the map. And you, depending on your zone, there's a list of things you can grow and a list of things you can't grow because they'll die. And the big thing about this is because of global warming, they've changed the map. Here's the 1990 map and here's the 2006 map and it got, it's got warmer. It can grow more. Here we are in Logan. We went from a zone four to about a zone five. So there's more things we can grow. I have Japanese maples now growing in my yard and everybody says, don't you know you can't grow those here? Well, it's an experiment and they're looking good. And maybe if some year we get a super cold winter, they'll be goners, but I'm counting on global warming, keep my Japanese maples alive. They're looking, they're looking good. I'm, I love it when the neighbors say, don't you know that you can't do that? So that's, that's, that's maps of this. And in fact, because of this, in our department many years ago, we started collecting all this climate data for about oof, 80 stations in Utah, and they made this little book Freezing probabilities in Utah. So you could tell when to plant, when you could grow. And then, now Rob Gillies, Alan Muller updated this. Now it's a bigger book. And I thought you would enjoy this. And I'll send this as a, as a handout. This is just charts. I put on four of these charts for uh, four different stations in Logan, this is the Logan radio station, KVNU is out at 600 West. Experiment station is like right here, out by the research greenhouses. This is campus. And then finally the College Ward Farm, which is on the way to Wellsville. Four stations, and because we're in a mountain, it really varies how cold it is. I mean, the, there's a lot of stuff you can't grow in the middle of the valley, and you can grow it up on the bench. It's just warmer. Um, but it's, it's, if you're interested in climate, and if you're gonna get a degree from a department that has climate in its name, you ought to look at this table. But it has ET in here, and record snow, minimum snow. This is the stuff climate people love. For every um, day of the year, and I just cut and pasted these four graphs for uh, the stations right around here. Here's record low temperatures. This is a 30-year average. And that's why it's updated every 10 years or so to um, get the average and records for this. I think the records are permanent. Record high and low are forever for the last 150 years. So that's climate data applied to this. Let's see. I think that's good. That's uh, an end of the uh, outline. I'm going to do one more lecture on nitrogen uptake and nitrogen metabolism in plants. Um, as a prelude to that, it, it, nitrogen is the only essential element that plants take up in two different forms, a cation and an anion, ammonium and nitrate. And they have very different fates inside the plant. They're also very different in the soil, but it gets interesting what happens to those in the uh, plant, and that's what we'll talk about in the final lecture. Right before class, I sent everyone an email with a copy of last year's final exam with the answers to the calculations. So make sure you get that, and th th that's a good study guide for the test. If you get stuck on problems, come and see us. Um, in email or some, some form, come and see us. But there's the study guide. I haven't given homework the last week, mainly because now you can shift to studying for the 
final. But with this lecture, you should, this, there's a bunch of questions on that final from this lecture. So you should be able to answer all the questions on that exam. We'll see you next time.